Okay, I think we can start. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce this talk today about the topic that I find very fascinating, exciting. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Siri Denk, who uh, received a, a doctoral degree in uh, mechanical and aerospace engineering from Princeton University. She was then a postdoc postdoctoral scholar at Stanford, and then she joined MIT as an assistant professor in 2019. So the research of uh, Professor C.B. Deng focuses on energy conversion and storage, and also the fundamental understanding of uh, combustions, combustion and emissions, uh, and the topic of today, which is physics-informed data-driven modeling go reacting flows. Um, very important to mention, uh, uh, Professor Deng received the Berners Bernard Lewis Fellowship from the Combustion Institute 2016 and also a National Science Foundation Career Award in 2022. Uh, so thank you again for accepting our invitation and I'll leave you the word, the floor, <laughs> the virtual floor. Thanks. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much for inviting me to uh, this 40 under 40 talk and I have this great opportunity to have a conversation with uh, the colleagues in the field, especially for people who are interested in combining some of the recently developed uh, machine learning techniques with our uh, combustion modeling and uh, fundamental understanding development. Uh, actually, for combustion research, we are not uh, new to uh, data-driven modeling approaches, or a better way to put it is that we do data assimilation on a daily basis, right? We run experiments and we uh, deduct models or fundamental physics laws from the observations and which will guide us into developing uh, high fidelity uh, CFD models and, and predict uh, the combustion dynamics and emissions. So combining a data-driven modeling approach with physics-based modeling approach is already an ongoing uh, effort in the scientific community, especially for combustion and reacting flow research. Uh, with the newly uh, developed uh, techniques in natural language processing and computer vision, they actually they open a new door to us to handle high dimensional data. And the challenge then becomes, can we actually just use whatever being developed in those community and try to enhance our understanding on fundamental combustions? Uh, the short answer is yes, we can borrow tools from them, but definitely we need to be able to tailor the tools because combustion problems are really rich in uh, the scientific problem, but also very challenging intellectually. So I'm uh, in today's talk, I aim to share with you some of the recent progress in my, uh, in my group, focusing on developing scientific machine learning techniques for uh, accelerating uh, combustion simulations with uh, a specific talk on kinetic modeling and uncertainty quantification of kinetic models. I would like to give you a brief overview of the research activities focusing on scientific machine learning for combustion in my research group. So in my opinion, right, for all the modeling, we're essentially doing two things. We develop the sub-models and put them together to be able to uh, predict the system response, such as uh, combustion dynamics and emissions, et cetera, and be able to do better control of the system. So there are two types of problem, generally speaking. The uh, first one is called a forward problem, meaning that how to combine the models and give predictions to the system. And for this uh, type of work, essentially we are balancing the fidelity of the prediction and the computational cost. So what I envision that machine learning in general can help or data simulation can help is by utilizing its general capacity on representing the system especially on representing a high order, high dimensional system with a viable computational cost. And this is backed, for, uh, for example, for neural networks, for example, this is backed by the universal approximation theorem that we can uh, approximate all the functions with complicated enough neural networks. So along this way, uh, in my group, we are developing method to replace the physical solver and try to overcome the stiffness issues 
particularly and try to accelerate the computations. Uh, as you would expect that due to the intrinsic chemical stiffness in the system, uh, leveraging such techniques in well de developed uh, uh, field actually isn't uh, applicable to our combustion research. So there are uh, places where we need to incorporate our understanding on the chemical system and try to build better tools for that. On the other hand, after we have models, intrinsically we have uh, approximations in the models or sometimes uh, uncertainty in terms of the model parameters. How does uh, uncertainty propagate into predicting the system responses is also a very important topic. So along that line, uh, our group also developed efficient uh, uncertainty quantification method to do uh, reduce order modeling, try to quantify the uh, uncertainties in those systems. And the other type of problems I call an inverse problem, meaning that if we can observe the system response, such as doing experiments, uh, how can we come up with some models and optimize the models? In these cases, if we already have a good uh, theoretical model, then it means how we can come up with the model parameters. And in this way, we can leverage data-driven modeling in terms of handling high dimensional data and try to do efficient regression and optimization to figure out the parameters for those models. And another topic is that what if we do not have a good understanding of the model? What if we want to automatically come up with a model by observing the experimental data, for example? Then uh, we are developing method to be able to aut autonomously discover models from data. And this is uh, the CRN work that I'm going to introduce first. And you could uh, scan this QR code and which will lead to a research portfolio page that uh, summarizes all the, all the work we published in this area. So before I dive into the detailed talk on the chemical reaction neural network that, that is developed in my group, I would like to first give you uh, an overview of how we came up with this idea. So um, as we put together models, especially for combustion systems, we have already had very good physical understanding for some problems, especially on the chemical kinetics. Those models are pretty robust in terms of it helps us understand what's going on in the system and uh, it can generalize to many systems. For example, if we can observe the uh, data or observe the uh, measurements in uh, 0D or 1D classical uh, systems, we can extract the physical information and come up with chemical models, which can be widely applicable to engine combustion uh, predictions and to turbulent flow predictions, etc. So this very good uh, interpretability and generalability are really the essence of coming up with this physical model and physical intuitions. On the other hand, black box modeling, especially nowadays, uh, a lot of people are talking about deep learning, handling a large quantity of data. It can really help us dealing with the high dimensional data that we can get from experiments and without the need to manually come up with template to explain what's going on and try to fit the parameters. For those uh, cases, like I mentioned before, we are utilizing the uh, universal approximation theorem and essentially create large neural networks to represent the system. Uh, however, it's also generally believed that for this type of black, black box modeling is really good for the data that we train it for. However, it's not expected to do a good job when we want to extend to a larger design space. So it's good to help us uh, doing interpolation rather than extrapolation. So what we really aim to do is to combine the best from both worlds and try to be able to handle high dimensional data and try to make it uh, autonomously discovering model while we still want to be able to understand what we get, being able to make sense of what we get with the hope that we can extend the model to other scenarios, which we have not uh, seen before. So that's, uh, that's the underlying thinking is to embed some physics into the training of machine learning models, combine the information 
from the science world or physical world to uh, the data-driven modeling approach. And the physics can be introduced in many ways. And generally speaking, it can be introduced as soft constraint, such as via the regularization of the parameters. You can put some constraint to those parameters and the, the relationship between different parameters. On the other hand, we could try to hard code such constraint in the architecture of the neural network. And that is the, the approach that we uh, developed. So the, the rationale for developing a chemical reaction neural network is actually quite straightforward. Uh, this is uh, pioneered by my, uh, at that time, the postdoc, uh, Dr. Wei Shi Ji. And essentially we, we looked into the physical world and we thought, okay, what could be the fundamental laws that are generally applicable? And we want to make sure that uh, whatever model we come up with using machine learning are uh, complied to. So we thought uh, the general laws could be the laws of mass, law of mass action, uh, telling us how molecules collide and, and that determines the reaction rate. And particularly for chemically reacting flow with strong heat release and the Arrhenius law that determines how this rate constant depends on temperature is also important. So we first started with these two to use them as the fundamental laws that we want the machine learning model to be aware of. And next is to introduce to you how we can incorporate this uh, physics laws into the architecture of the neural networks. And let me show you an example. Uh, a simple reaction this is one uh, reaction. Uh, written in this way with methane and uh, oxygen as the uh, reactants and producing CO2 and water. And how we can uh, think about the law of mass action is this. We can write down the expression for the reaction rate as a rate constant times uh, a combination of the concentrations of the reactants. And mathematically, we can also express this by taking the natural log and What's important is this, we have a linearized exponent and we have a nonlinear operator, which is the taking the exponential, right? And if we want to uh, describe this correlation via a graph, we can do it this way. So on this nodes, we can take the natural log of the species concentration and via some linear combination corresponding to the uh, constant in front of these terms. And this is another uh, constant that we can add. So this is a linear uh, operation. We can come up with this intermediate step. And by taking this operation of taking the exponential, we have the expression for the reaction rate. And turning reaction rate into the consumption and production of the uh, reactants and products respectively, we can just uh, incorporate the information from the stoichiometric coefficient. So you could imagine that we can express this physical law into this graph. And for people who are familiar with neural networks, you can recognize that this is actually a three layer neural network with the first layer of input layer and, and second layer, the hidden layer, and the final output layer to be the, the species uh, production slash uh, consumption rate. So you can see this, all these constants are the weights and the biases in the input layer. And this non-linear uh, function uh, is the activation energy, uh, activation function in the physical law, but also which it's a specifically picked activation function for the neural network. And in the upper layer, the constant all corresponds to the weights in sense of neural networks. But what's so interesting is all of these weights and biases have their fundamental physical meanings, such as the reaction order and reaction rate constant. And the upper layer similarly also have their physical meanings. This means that if we were able to train the neural network in this form, the weights, biases, all of these information can be readily interpreted as physical parameters. 
So we have a physically interpretable neural network rather than a black box neural network. As I mentioned, uh, that example just showed you how to incorporate uh, law of mass action to describe reaction rate. For a lot of applications uh, in chemically reacting flow, especially combustion applications, we have a temperature dependence on the reaction uh, of this uh, reaction constant, rate constant. And similarly, we can take the linear operation here to describe the logarithm of the rate constant. And similarly, we can expand this neuron by using other neurons and connect via this structure. Now we just have more uh, interpretable uh, biases and weights according to the neural net network, but they all have their physical uh, parameters uh, in the counterpart. So to summarize, we can actually stack all of these neurons and form a three-layer neural network, but the input layer is known. Uh, and what we need to in, uh, input into this neural network is the species concentrations and the temperature of the system. And we need to take some uh, natural log for the species and, and the, the other operations on the temperatures. And in the hidden layer, actually the number of the hidden uh, nodes in the hidden layers correspond exactly to the number of reactions in this uh, physical chemical system. And then they are connected and contribute to the consumption and production of the species of interest. So if uh, one, two, and three reactions all contribute to the change of methane, then they have connections to this. If, um, for example, if uh, an, an, another species is not involved, then you will not have angle, uh, you will not have arrows pointing to them. So theoretically speaking, if we have a physical system, we have a chemical model, we can express the chemical model analytically using this graph representation. So if you turn this problem uh, back, it becomes, okay, maybe we can use this framework to train based on the observations of how the species changes in time and be able to figure out the weights and biases of this neural network. And then we can take another step by interpreting them back into the physical parameters corresponding to the reaction order, stoichiometric coefficient, activation energy, uh, et cetera. And I'm going to show you a few case studies. You don't need to pay uh, closer attention to the actual system. I just want to show you some features that is uh, illustrated via these uh, case studies. And then we will move on to more realistic applications of the framework. So for example, this uh, synthetic network, uh, it's uh, generally uh, being used to represent a chemically reacting system with five species and four reactions. And by giving us all the species profiles, how that change with time, and we can learn automatically without being, without need to specify this reaction template. And we can figure out the reaction rate. As you could see in this two-dimensional uh, matrix, the plot uh, here is the reactions, here is a uh, uh, species uh, related to the, uh, the system five species and four reactions, this is a very sparse matrix, meaning that only a few uh, re uh, reactants are participating in one reaction. Similarly, we utilized this biodiesel production scheme to validate our model uh, to, to see if we can accurately capture the temperature dependence in, in the Arrhenius coefficient. And uh, similar to the previous example, we are able to come back to this sparse system as well as quantitatively figuring out uh, the kinetic parameters in addition to the chemical pathways. Actually, chemical systems are ubiquitous, not only in the chemical engineering systems combustion, but also in biological systems. And uh, for, for that community, actually they didn't model it any different from, uh, from, from the combustion community. Still the law of maxion 
is uh, is relevant and uh, at, uh, treated as a fundamental law. So probably this look less familiar to us, but essentially this is uh, this protein uh, regulation process. Uh, you can really uh, think about this as catalytic reactions. So all of these uh, activated proteins uh, in the biological system, they, they are called enzymes. But uh, if we use the language that we are familiar with, they, they work as a catalyst. So they appear in the equation both on both ends in the uh, reactants and, and also products. But uh, the CRN framework can learn the, the system just all right with all the uh, species and reactions identified and sparsely related to each other. So with these three test cases, we validate the capacity of giving you the full profile of the species and whether you can automatically come up with the reaction uh, schemes as well as quantitatively predict the rates and uh, stoichiometric coefficient, et cetera. So we, at this point, we think that our framework can really be applied to real data and see if it can help us with some uh, physics and even help us figure out uh, the fundamental physics. So this is a really interesting case. Actually, this is a case too before, but we, we take a deeper look into this uh, case. So there are three scenarios being considered. As you would see, there are six species in this case. And first, when we train the first model, we uh, tell the neural network that there are six species that is involved in the system. And we have information for all of them regarding the time history. And we can train the well, one, uh, M1 model. As you can see, it can really uh, predict uh, this uh, species uh, responses uh, as a function of time. In the second scenario, we knew that there is a species called DG, but in reality, we just cannot measure it. So we tell the neural network that there are six species. However, we were only given this five species profiles. As you could see, for the M2 model, we can just model the entire system all right. In the third case, we actually do not know there is a missing species called DG. We can observe five species. And then we thought, OK, there are only five species that are relevant to the problem. And you could see that while we are still able to give predictions, some, reaction, some species responses are quite off, while others are, are doing OK job. So by comparing these two, we know that there is something wrong. And we definitely want to incorporate another species. We might not know it's DG, but we know there is a missing species in the system. Without it, we won't be able to accurately capture the responses of the entire system. So you could think about this way, is that we can model the number of species and number of reactions in the neural network as hyperparameters, so they can be changed. And by changing these parameters, we can, in, the, in terms of training, we can balance the accuracy and model size. But in terms of physics, it can tell us whether there are some species that we cannot measure, but are definitely important to be able to predict the entire system. So we get to know there are some unknown unknowns. And with this uh, capacity in mind, we can actually use the CRN framework and model the number of species and reactions as hyperparameters, such that we can identify a viable model to, to describe what we can observe. So in this case, we're using uh, literature compiled real experiments and focus on a more complicated scenario, which is a biomass pyrolysis. In terms of application, biomass can be used to, to make biofuels and in the wild land, Actually, biomass contribute to the, the fire safety concerns. Actually, when we model uh, wildfire propagation and predict uh, how disastrous that could be and how fast it can propagate, actually the kinetics for the biofuels the, in the wild, actually it's very difficult uh, to come up with such models. 
So what uh, the community usually do is to do uh, the TGA analysis, thermal gravimetric analysis, by putting some samples of the biomass into a chamber and controlling the, the flow condition, either in inert or uh, different concentrations of oxygen, and control the heating rate and see how the mass of uh, the system changes in time. So the complexity really is that uh, we are only seeing the partial information compared to the previous examples that I showed you that we have species uh, profiles resolved in time. In this case, we cannot specify, okay, there are 10 species or 15 species. What we can only ob observe is the, the mass of the condensed phase. And the mass is changing because there are some volatile uh, matters that is leaving the system. Right, so it's really a, a lower dimension information that we can get from this. And generally speaking, people think that machine learning or data-driven modeling approach is generally data hungry. It depends on how you look at it. So for this case, uh, in the literature, we can gather 10 experiments for the TGA, uh, or 14 of them uh, we can gather, and we use 10 of them for the training and four of them to test the performance. And due to the space uh, limitation, I'm showing you uh, six cases we use for training and two cases uh, for the validation. And you can see uh, the composition of the gases and also heating rate, they are all different in those cases. So really for, for each case, we don't have too much information, okay? And in terms of modeling it, the information that we know is that sometimes we have oxygen reacting with the system, such as these uh, cases. Uh, the mass that we put into, we know the fuel, what we put into this is cellulose. And uh, the mass change is due to some volatile matter that is leaving the system. That's pretty much all we need, all we know. So we model other intermediate species as pseudo species, knowing meaning that we don't know how many of them could be. We we just put another uh, four here, but in the system we can we can use this as a as a hyperparameter that we can change using a grid search. Also for the reactions, uh, we also do not know how many would be uh, relevant. So we also make it big enough and try to do the grid search to it. So that's the general framework. And this is a quick summary of uh, what we got. So after feeding, feeding this uh, experiment into the system, we are able to predict uh, this reaction scheme in this matrix form. And like I mentioned, all these biases and weights have their physical meaning. So we can further interpret this and translate them into the chemical pathways that we're most familiar with, with their corresponding uh, reaction uh, kinetic parameters. But what's so important about this is that although we are not sure what these intermediate species are, we can not name them, we can predict how they change over time and can draw physical intuition out of it. And of course, we pick this cellulose case because the uh, this system has already been uh, investigated by the research community, so we can actually make sense of the intermediate species S2 and S3. They correspond to the active cellulose and char. That is, uh, and we can also compare the neuron, uh, the network that is deducted via uh, our uh, CRNN framework and with the, what covered in the literature. And they agree with each other pretty well. And like I mentioned, uh, this can, CRN approach can be used to understand a condensed matter paralysis and can handle really uh, convoluted information regarding the mass change. And another type of uh, condensed matter and uh, convoluted information would be the thermal runaway of batteries. For example, it's also a very uh, timely topic, especially uh, every energy sector is looking into electrification and using batteries, because battery safety is a big concern. Um, during the operation of batteries, uh, there are exothermic reactions. And when those reactions are, are fast enough and the heat loss to the system is slow enough, uh, we can trigger 
undesired uh, uh, fires from batteries. So it's very important to be able to capture the thermal runaway uh, mechanism and be able to, to come up with models and come up with uh, control schemes. So for understanding battery thermal runaway, typically the data that we can gather is called a differential scanning calorimetry. So similar to the TGA analysis, in these type of uh, experiments, we can uh, gather the, the uh, reaction scheme for uh, different components uh, and, and uh, still putting things into a, a chamber, flowing some gases, and be able to track the heat flow from the system. So typically, uh, a DSC experiment would look like this. And this material particularly is uh, nickel, cobalt, manganese. 811 is a composition. It's a one type of uh, the next generation lithium ion batteries. Uh, this is a cathode material, which is uh, which can have uh, exothermic reactions if it decomposes. Um, so in the literature, this is a, typically how things are done. So by looking at this uh, DSC curve, you can see there are several peaks. And we can, in the literature, model these peaks independently. And each peak would correspond to one reaction. So we can uh, follow a law called the Kissinger analysis and try to deduct the activation energy uh, of the reactions, et cetera. While this seems to be a reasonable approach to predict this material with very clear three peaks, actually, if we, this experiment is done via the same group, by the same group, but the uh, different material, this is a, another composition uh, with 822 uh, in molar ratio and crystal structure wise is a polycrystalline compared to the single crystalline. Actually, what you would see is that there's only actually two peaks. However, we, we knew that there would be three reactions. So it's kind of arbitrary where to draw the second reaction. And if, uh, of course, uh, the software, they can tell you, OK, there are three peaks if you want to fit to three peaks. However, you can see the second peak, which re corresponding to the second reaction, happens before the first peak, the first reaction. So the second reaction actually would be the decomposition of some intermediate species after the decomposition of the original species. So this has quickly become unphysical, although fitting to the data is still quite well. So how do we deal with the real physics while still maintaining the, the high level of uh, uh, agreement with the data is we tailor our CRNN approach and incorporate heat release information. This is done by my graduate student, Ben. So the CRNN part is still the same. Actually, it's even simpler because we know uh, there are three steps. So we can explicitly write down the three steps. Uh, but what's different is that in term, uh, in addition to predict species, which is not observed in the experiments, uh, we can incorporate heat release for those uh, reactions and predict the thermal profiles. And just to give you a, a, a flavor of what we can get out of this is that uh, because what we can get is a chemical model, so we can predict case that is not uh, conducted in the literature. And we can compare this with some other experiments done by the material scientists. They did the experiment not in the DSC, but in the, the thermal XRD, meaning that they can look at the phases during the thermal transition. So they can give us a window where uh, the materials uh, decompose and switch to another phase. As you could see, compared to this shaded area, this real, this true to physics model, actually the solid line can predict this window relatively well and is much better compared to the literature where they assume independent three reactions. And uh, so after we get this uh, uh, model, we can also have uh, analysis on the global trend, meaning that how does this uh, uh, thermal runaway uh, tendency changes with the composition we have, 
a general trend is that if we have a higher nickel ten in a content, it's good for the battery in terms of its capacity, but it's also more susceptible to uh, thermal runaway. And also, uh, if we have a single crystal, which is relatively difficult, uh, more difficult to make in industry in the process. However, it will have a better thermal uh, stability compared to the polycrystalline structures. So all of these physical trends can be well captured by uh, the CRN and skin model predicted by the CRN and skin. Uh, this is the ongoing work. We are working on it. But uh, just to give you a flavor is that the DSC experiment I showed you is just one set. However, in the literature, it's a very active uh, uh, area where many groups does uh, do this uh, experiment and try to figure out uh, the thermal responses for the decomposition. However, although most of the group follow the same procedure in treating the samples uh, due to the uncertainty in the handling as well as the vendors, et cetera, although they claim to be the same material, um, the thermal profiles look quite different, I would say, right? So how do we handle this uh, very uh, different profiles and how do we handle the, the noise in the data is actually quite challenging. And, uh, to, uh, and to, to handle this issue, we actually, instead of uh, doing a deterministic CRN, we have a Bayesian CRN, meaning that uh, in, instead of modeling the great parameters, kinetic parameters in a deterministic way, we give it a distribution to accommodate for two things. The first is the measurement might have uncertainties, right? So the inferred model will have uncertainties. Second one is that because we are fitting to the model, then it's not guaranteed that is, we are always going to converge to the ground truth. So there might be the possibility of having multiple models that can fit the data relatively well. So motivated by these two points, we want to be able to model the uncertainties in the model and be able to predict uh, and put a, a confidence uh, interval to the predictions. Without going too much into the details, uh, with this Bayesian approach, we can actually further see the advantage of embedding the physics into the neural network structure and inform the training of the neural network. In this particular case, we are going back to the case one, we have five species and, and four reactions. And in this particular case, uh, we, we were only given the initial uh, few seconds, about two seconds of information, and the fast changing of the species are actually not captured in the, in the experiment. And we can only see the relatively slow change after the 28 seconds. So we are giving the training only missing information. Right. However, because we embed physics into it, we can still be able to deduct this model very, very well. But of course, because we have a missing information, then the uncertainty would be quite large. Right. And compare this CRNN approach where we embed physics into it to uh, just a naive neural network with very big size, very deep neural network. Uh, the advantage is also very clear. Although both models can capture the uh, evolution of the reaction profile relatively well, actually in terms of uncertainty, because we have physics embedded, we can uh, significantly reduce the uncertainty in the deducted model because we have a good inductive bias because we know it's you need to uh, comply to the fundamental physical laws rather than using uh, a higher amount or higher order of a model to fit the system. So essentially we, uh, we can uh, avoid having an overfitting of the model. And as I mentioned, it might be possible to be able to have a mul multiple models that can work relatively well in predicting the system responses. So in those cases, we can have an ensemble prediction and be able to see globally how we can deal with the uncertainties. 
And to give you a brief summary is that the CRNN approach can incorporate the fundamental physical laws into the architecture of the neural network. It can help us simultaneously infer the chemical reaction pathways as well as the kinetic parameters. We can model them in the deterministic way, but also be able to capture the noise in the, in the uh, training data and be able to uh, infer the uncertainty of this inferred model. Because we have incorporated physics into the training process, we also have this potential to handle more convoluted data as well as extrapolate to other conditions and be able to have knowledge transfer by stacking different uh, neural networks together uh, corresponding to uh, having a, a hierarchical structure of the chemical reaction schemes. I know that I spent most of the time on um, discussing the model discovery, but as I alluded to, uh, after we get this model, we want to be able to predict how the system responses. And sometimes uh, this prediction can be very computationally expensive. Then we also developed scientific machine learning approaches to do efficient and certainty quantification via reduced order modeling. You might be familiar with this phrase that all models are wrong, but some are useful. But how do we tell how useful these models is, is uh, we need to do the forward and certainty quantification and see how the model parameters would influence the system responses. As far as turbulent combustion simulations is concerned, then the challenges are really twofold. The first one is, if we want to use detailed chemistry, essentially we're dealing with a very high dimensional uh, sample. For example, if we have 100 reactions involved, then we essentially have a 100 dimension. And how to uh, perturb the rate parameters and see how the kinetic models would influence performance, performance of the combustion uh, simulation, it actually would require a lot of simulations. And each simulation for the turbulent combustion is actually very, very expensive. So in order to uh, have efficient UQ, essentially there are two ways that we can do. First is to come up with a reduced sampling approach, right? To, to reduce the number of simulations needed. The second one is to try to have a cheaper uh, simulations. Uh, this is, uh, this can be done uh, for simple targets, such as the highest temperature or the lift off height of some jet flame uh, for turbulent cases. However, if we want to evaluate the entire system, it's actually of the flow field is actually quite difficult to come up with this uh, surrogate model. So we focus on the, the first part to reduce the needed sampling. The hypothesis here is that we want to be able to find a low dimensional kinetic subspace on top of which we, we perturb, perturb the kinetics and being able to analyze the responses. And as such, uh, finding of this low dimensional kinetic subspace, we want to do it via analyzing the laminar flamelets. And this approach that we are using is called active subspace. It's similar to the principal component uh, analysis, but the active subspace method is actually trying to find the important subspace uh, and by be, by be able to find the basis directions. And in this schematic, it's showing you how this uh, generally works. So you will see this uh, response of the system, which is indicated by this color map, is determined by two parameters. So the dimension of this problem is two. However, if we plot the responses, you can see along this line, we have the same value in responses. Whereas along this blue line, the system response changes most significantly. So we can identify this direction, this vector, to be the active direction. And we can just change the parameters in this direction to be able to see how the system response depend on the perturbation of the parameter. And in this example case, originally we need to perturb two dimensional space. After doing this active subspace analysis, we reduce the dimension to only one 
And uh, you will imagine if we're dealing with a 100 sub uh, dimension in kinetic parameters, if we are able to find just the one dimension, then we can reduce the needed perturbation significantly. And this is done by the active uh, subspace uh, approach. So essentially for the physical simulation, we use uh, the flamelet as a good representation of the system that we are interested in. So a flamelet is parameterized by the strain rate and the mixture fraction, telling us the, the local mixing as well as the composition. And uh, the, the thing we are most interested in is how the kinetic parameters act with the change the response of the flame. So by fixing uh, at a fixed uh, uh, strain rate and mixture fraction, we can evaluate how the temperature of the how the temperature changes as we per perturb the parameters uh, in the kinetic space. And we can take the gradient, essentially it's a sensitivity, and we can perturb this chemical model many, many times, m times, and uh, taking the average. So essentially we can get a matrix that contain all the sensitivities, kinetic sensitivities uh, of the flame response to the chemical kinetic parameters. And then we can do this uh, decomposition, eigenvalue analysis, and pick how many eigenvalues that are important for the problem and be able to deduct the eigenvectors and use those eigenvectors to form the active subspace. Because this is actually quite straightforward. However, if you look at it, due to the calculation for the sensitivity, it requires a million to 10 million evaluations of the gradient. So it would be intangible if we were to manually perturb the mechanism and then see how the temperature changes. And that's why we turn to neural networks to have us, to give us this low uh, gradient information at lower cost. And this is again uh, by my, done by my student, Ben. Essentially, we are interested in the problem of seeing how this can uh, uncertainty propagate into turbulent flame simulation. And in order to do that, we first come up with laminar flamelets and try to train and specialize the neural network to replace the evaluation of flamelets. And the, Based on this neural network, we can, we can perform active subspace uh, analysis and try to come up with a lower dimension subspace in chemical kinetics, such that we, can on we only need to perturb that low dimensional space to get samples. And in validation, we compare this approach with the traditional approach where a, higher, a much higher number of perturbation is needed. As uh, the neural network uh, is concerned, we adopted this two-part parameter network. Essentially, the physics is embedded in this way, is that for the coordinate, because uh, in the mixture, sub mixture fraction space, the coordinate is a mixture fraction. So we have a specified uh, neural network just to take the information from uh, the co physical coordinate mixture fraction. And for the kinetic uh, parameters, they are incorporated in this parameter network, as well as the strain rate, which is also a parameter. So by definition, by design, we separate the influence from the parameters of the system and the physical coordinate of the system. And the crosstalk happens only at the last layer, where we take a prop dot product and be able to predict the temperature. In the uh, flamelet analysis, we can deduct the, the near extinction subspace. As you could see, by looking at the matrix and being able to have the eigenvalues, we identified, OK, only the first uh, eigenvalue is able to see the entire, uh, capture most of the information. So we can reduce in that particular case, uh, originally we have 217 dimensions of the rate constant that are relevant. Actually, we come up with a, just a one dimensional subspace, meaning that all of these 217 
uh, grid constant can be perturbed in a coordinated way. So we only need to perturb it uh, once uh, in one direction. And all the if we perturb the first reaction, other reactions are perturbed corresponding. Similarly, we can, as we can observe that this uh, active sub space where this uh, direction is changing as we change uh, the, the strain rate. So we can actually evaluate this at different strain rate and concatenate them together and become another matrix and do a singular value decomposition to be able to find the global subspace for the entire uh, mixture fraction and uh, strain rate in the flamelet table. As I mentioned, Finally, we can only we, we only need a three sub uh, dimensional subspace to in incorporate the entire and certain information from this uh, flame table. I know that we are getting close to the end of the session, so I'm just going to give you a high level summary of what we can do. So by analyzing the three dimension subspaces, we can identify some important reactions, but you could see the, the amount is actually quite large. So one would think, okay, if we cannot perturb that many, we might just need to pick a few uh, sensitive reactions. So shown on this page, you could see, even for the sensitive reactions, we can actually have a lot. So being able to deduct only to three subspaces is really helpful. And we validate this in a Sandia D flame. So we simulate the Sandia D flame and, and we can use the traditional method by perturbing randomly the uh, 2000 times to uh, uh, get the statistics of the turbulent flame. Whereas we can also perturb the three dimensional subspace by only seven times. And then you could see that we can get uh, the statistics converged to and agree to pretty good level. And we can actually, if we, you want to get better uh, agreement, you can change the number of perturbations for the lower uh, subspace. For example, if we do set 50 samples instead of seven, we can achieve a much higher, around 90% agreement compared to the full samples. But still, we are having a 40 times uh, less simulation needed. So that can accelerate the UQ effort by a large amount. And although we've been tracking temperature in the training, actually the prediction for the untracked species in this particular case is a carbon monoxide is also relatively well. So we hope to be able to extend this framework to other uh, uncertainty quantifications effort in turbulent flames. Finally, I know that many people in the audience are interested in exploring, uh, applying machine learning or developing scientific machine learning technologies for combustion simulations. So our group actually put all of these uh, software uh, online, uh, open sources, and feel free to try them. Uh, they support uh, GPU computations. They are also uh, open sources. And we are also very happy to collaborate on kinetic modeling and certainly quantification and creating digital twins for dynamic systems. So with, uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, you all for your uh, attention and uh, welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. Um, I would actually open the floor for questions. Um, is there any question from the audience? Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, thank you for a nice talk. Uh, I was curious, why did you choose active subspaces as a, as a reduction technique? And have you considered uh, a technique like PCA, for example? Um, what was kind of the rationale behind using the active subspaces? Yeah, so there are similarities between the PCA analysis and uh, I can show you uh, the pages. So the difference, yeah. So it's actually similar to PCA, but in the sense of 
uh, for PCA, you also need to uh, analyze the, the sensitivity. And for this particular case is that we, we can have a global sensitivity uh, uh, in addition to, to the local sensitivity that PCA takes. So they are in the same vein, but we actually expand the entire kinetic, uh, uh, kinetic space, right? So if you don't have this sum, this is just the same as PCA. At a, for each mechanism, you can have the sensitivity. But we are actually, by perturbing the K, so that's what the M is corresponding to, by sampling many, many, many different chemical models, we get a global uh, sensitivity in that sense. Right, thank you. Thank you, Camila. Are there other questions? I have, I have, I have, I have a few questions thank you. as well. Okay, no, I, Alexander, ahead, I would like to go, ask go, go. a question. Yeah, yeah, because I have only one question for now. Thank you, Professor Deng, for your very interesting talk. I have a question regarding the uh, loss function, because sometimes in, you know, in physics informed neural networks, they usually the the, uh, the information coming from the physics uh, is uh, projected, let's say, into, is included and embedded in the loss function. Instead, here it seems that it's the real the structure itself of the neural network to be informed by physics. So I was wondering if also the loss function is somehow informed or is just a, a traditional loss function based on mean square error or similar uh, metrics. Exactly. Thank you so much for the question. So I agree hundred percent. For example, in the in the PN approach. Uh, the physics is embedded in the loss function. So in that particular case, actually the, the constraint comes, it is a soft constraint, right? Um, in our case, we want to make sure that definitely we want to have law of max action. We don't want to approximate law of max action. We want to have it in the exact form. So that's why we chose it to be incorporated in the structure to make sure it's a hard constraint. So either you cannot come up with a model Whenever you come up with a model, it has to be true for, for those two fundamental laws. And uh, for other cases, like I mentioned, if we want to incorporate higher other, uh, other constraint, we can maybe lump them into the loss function. In the cases that I presented, we, we just use uh, MAE or MSE uh, for the loss function directly on the, the, the training that we are doing. For other cases, if we want to emphasize certain features, we can also uh, adapt the loss functions to incorporate further information. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you. I don't know if uh, in the meantime, people got ideas for questions, but I, I have a few uh, myself. So for the... Um, um, for the for the use of active subspaces, right? So uh, to understand well that in fact, so you have to use you have to do this uh, SVD or PCA in the in the gradient space, uh, and basically you need uh, uh, to have several samples to assess this uncertainty, which is the reason why usually these active subspaces has be, have been limited for very large simulations. So like for cases where you had where people had uh, a few uh, or at very, very, let's say, uh, CPU intensive simulations and the, the, the computation of these several points was difficult. So is this uh, the reasoning behind the fact that you have been using neural networks to in fact surrogate you know, the, the computation of the, of the, uh, of the laminar premix flame, flamelet? And if this is the case, would you see a similar let's say, uh, schematic also for more intensive simulations of, uh, let's say, more complex systems? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. I, I think that the answer would be twofold. Uh, it will be illustrated in this schematic. As you mentioned on the active subspace analysis, I would think that it would be difficult to uh, use active subspace for the entire flow field, right? Yep. So or, for, for this case, for example, we are only looking at a scalar, 
of course, this is a higher dimension. We can have different flamelets. In each flamelet, we can have different mixture fraction. But at each case, we are only at one scalar. However, if you have a flow field, if you have a grid, if you have a 10 million grid, then each at each grid and for temperature, we have a we have a scalar. So essentially, you need to have an extremely high dimension. So that's that's why we are not aiming at having a active subspace analyzed on the entire flow field. So that's where the why, why we call it scientific machine learning approach for accelerating uh, computation is this. So we the fundamental physics that we have is that there would be some similarities between the turbulent combustion and the laminar combustion in terms of chemical kinetics. Okay. Yeah. So we do the that's why we do the uh, active subspace on the kinetic space on the laminar flames that are relatively easy to uh, analyze rather than directly on turbulent ones. And using the neural network is, is just this, is that we need to get the sensitivities. So we need to take the gradient. So what would you normally do, right? You would perturb your mechanism and see how the temperature changes. Say you perturb it by 5%, your temperature change by whatever, and you take the finite difference. Then taking the finite difference itself it's very time consuming and also there is some also the precision uh, issues, et cetera. So we want to do it in an analytical way or do it via the back propagation. That is what neural network can do very, very well. So we are pretty much just utilizing this pr back propagation optimization uh, capacity for the neural network to replace uh, the physical solver of uh, flamelets. Whereas I know that in scientific uh, world, people are also trying to completely uh, maybe remove the CFD uh, via, via neural network evaluation. I have not seen many successful examples yet, but I can also appreciate how difficult that could be. Indeed, indeed. Um, okay, maybe I have just a small curiosity. What about... Uh... Thermodynamics. So what I mean is that uh, thermodynamic data, transport data, uh, have also been, um, let's say, shown a great impact uh, in terms of uncertainty. I mean, there have been studies recently showing also the uh, uncertainty associated to um, to transport and thermodynamic data in terms of uh, overall uncertainty of the prediction. So I was wondering, uh, how do you see also the thermodynamic data, for instance, coming into play in this framework where you actually try and replace the uh, the solver with uh, with this uh, constrained neural network. Yeah, so um, the framework that we develop is only on the kinetic side. So if we were to look at other parameters, uh, I know in the, in the system actually, uh, in the community, people have been looking at other equations and uh, other parameters in, in that, such as the transport properties, et cetera. So you would be come up with another toy system or, or a lower dimensional system and try to do the evaluations there and scale that up to the real uh, simulation. That would be my short answer to do that. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know if uh, other people have uh, curiosities or questions otherwise. I really would like to thank you again for this uh, very, very nice talk that I really enjoyed a lot. Thank you again. And uh, um, until next time, thank you. Thank you so much again for hosting me at this uh, webinar and thank you all for attending this. I wish everyone uh, a wonderful weekend. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. You too. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.